Hello there. Welcome. It's so nice of you to be able to join us in worship today. We're so glad that you are with us. I'm Pastor Gary McCluskey, pastor here at University Lutheran Church, Lutheran Campus Ministry in Tempe, Arizona, at Arizona State University. We thank you, as always, for taking part. And our worship now for this seventh Sunday of Easter begins. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth. Like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts, shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. with you. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts. In those days, Peter stood among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. 
So some of the men who have accompanied us during all this time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Here ends the reading. Psalm 1 Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. The second reading is from 1 John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Here ends the reading. Alleluia, alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? According to John, the 17th chapter, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name and you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you. I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Unity is not found in me. Neither is it found in you. It's found in none of us. Now, there's a lot of talk right now about the need for unity today, and certainly with good reason. But as I listen to a lot of this conversation, most people's definition of what unity would look like is that it would somehow look like people like me, or at least people who believe as I do. Such unity is as exclusive as it is uniting. It can only unite some. Now, certainly, we do a lot of that. Many of us, we belong to all kinds of groups that rally around a set of beliefs or even activities, and we find unity in those groups, at least unity around our group's basic principles and perhaps functions. We need to ask ourselves, is there a greater, a higher unity than that which we believe, however important. Is there a higher unity, a greater unity than that whom we see ourselves and others like us to be? I'm convinced Jesus would argue there is. Almost 20 times today in our text from John, Jesus uses the first person, the word I in that text. Throw in a couple of me's and a handful of mine that are also in that text. And it seems clear Jesus is taking credit for keeping the flock together. John, in John's gospel, certainly wants us to understand Jesus is our unity. Yes, Jesus taught them. Yes, Jesus revealed all sorts of things about God to them. But as we know the history of the church, we know the history of the disciples, we know that they had issues with one another on some of these things, except Jesus being their unity. Their source, our source of unity and our only and true unity. Not our values, not our beliefs, not our sense of things right or wrong. Now, these are, of course, important. We base how we live on many of these. But they also can be exclusive when it comes to something like being united. Think of this for a moment. Every church I've ever served, and so many churches that I've been into or church newsletters and websites that I have read often call themselves a family. Now, that has connotations of a warm, good feeling. It's a good label for a congregational community. But on the other hand, what is more exclusive than family? Most of us don't let just anyone into our family. Jesus is our unity. And the church, of course, throughout its history has not done all that well at this. Now, the ecumenical efforts following World War II and beyond, they are great efforts, great efforts to work together to overcome divisions in the body of Christ. But the unity they achieve is having constructed a rather flimsy kind of building than instead a safe, strong home. It may be a shelter of sorts, but one that can easily collapse. I'm fond of repeating something a professor once said many years ago. He would say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and regret that it doesn't exist. Now, certainly institutionally, it does not. Yet, yet, can we not say unity True unity is actually a given. We have, not we can have, not we will have, 
We have unity and it is given to us in Jesus Christ. It is there. The problem is we do not live as though we have this unity. We deny it in the way we build walls, construct our institutions, our denominations and congregations. We look for unity in me and in us. We need to set our sights higher, much higher than us, much higher than we. We need to lift our gaze to the unity given in Jesus. This can also be instructive for the unity we seek in our communities and our culture. If unity can only be found among the like-minded, or among those of the same race or ethnicity or religion, there is and there will be no real unity. There will be a whole lot of separate, divided unities. What if somehow in our culture now, we set our sights higher than ourselves, higher than our own tribe? What if unity was to be found not in the way we understand our beliefs and values as individuals and groups, but in our living, our voting, our participating and living in our culture. What if patriotism, we throw that word around so much today, what if it wasn't defined as some rigid mold, steps one through 10 and you must be exactly like this? What if we defined patriotism more generally as love of country? Something above that list of 10, 20, whatever it is, things we have. Could we even allow and see then fellow patriots arguing and arguing about various principles rather than saying you're a patriot or I'm a patriot, you're a traitor. The latter is the way we've been operating. And the latter has gotten us nowhere in the past few years and has little hope of doing anything but being further destructive. Do we see when we look around, fellow Americans, or do we see those who must be subdued? After all, they're not like us. Can we as a culture, can we as a culture set our sights higher? Now it is fine to have and share characteristics of a group. Judaism is excellent at this. When I converse with my Jewish friends, you know, and I hear all about special diet, sometimes a particular wardrobe for some and certain practices that are a must. But when I talk with them, they say, well, it's not really so much about unity. It is more about identity, who they are and whose they are. You see, you and I, we can still have identity as who we are and still find unity. We can have our own spiritual and cultural catechisms, yet find unity above and beyond them. The very best marks of identity might be those that plunge us head first into the world beyond us, recognizing there can even be a certain unity with those who are far different than us, even those perhaps who may oppose us. A story that I've always liked is one of a man sitting in a pew in about the second row of his church on a Sunday morning worship. Remember when churches used to do that, come together and sit pews and such? Uh, anyhow, he was sitting there and the pastor is preaching. And as the pastor preaches, this man is nodding his head, not falling asleep, nodding in agreement. Worship is over. And as they're having coffee, one of the members comes up and says, John, how can you do that? You sit there nodding in agreement as she preaches, as the pastor preaches. And I know you stand against most everything she says. How can you do that? And John says, well, when my wife was dying and when she died, our pastor, she was there. She was there all the time, caring for my wife, caring for me and my family. I'm able to see that there's something much more than the words she is saying on a Sunday morning. Jesus mentions 
the world in today's text. And the world gets a bum rap in a lot of Christian circles, and we can see a little of that in this text today, but too often it is seen as the not very loyal opposition. And certainly there is much outside in the world opposing the things of Jesus. And sometimes, if we know our history, the world has taught the church a thing or two first. And too often, too often, there is much inside the church as well that is not as it should be. The world is less a place to fear and despise and more a place to enter, as Jesus says, sending those folks, those disciples into the world. The world is much more a place to enter, to live and to serve and to be that follower of Jesus. This is where we do it in the world. Jesus says he was sent into the world and says, therefore, he sends his followers into that same world. There's a unity the church has with the world. Remember, it is John's gospel where Jesus says, for God so loved the world. Jesus didn't come just for the church. Jesus didn't just arrive for those who would follow him. True unity, the unity in Jesus is always found above us, above the world, above the church. We need the world. We need Jesus. We need the God who sent Jesus, who is revealed in this Jesus. We need to recognize and work to live out the unity we have in Jesus. Jesus, in our text today, prays for us to be one. So we need to lift our sights. Unity. Being one is far above just being us and with people like us. However and whomever we understand us. Unity is far above us. Jesus made it so. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Together with the words of the Apostles' Creed, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. You call the whole church on earth to worship and bless you. Empower your church to bear joyful witness to your love, made known in Jesus Christ. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have fashioned a habitat for all your creatures, and you fill the earth with your glory. Give rain where it is needed, and rescue those inundated by floods. Mend what we have torn in the fabric of creation and replenish and nourish your world. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In the majesty of your love, you rule the world with justice and mercy. Give those in authority the spirit of your love so that all who are hungry and poor receive food and resources and all people flourish and live in peace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You heal those who are sick and bind up the brokenhearted. Attend to the cares and needs of the hurting and hopeless in our congregation, community, workplaces, schools, and families. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You have gathered us in this community of faith, enlightened our hearts, and given us a share of the immeasurable greatness of your power. Help us love one another be reconciled where we are divided, and share the riches of your grace with our neighbors. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We thank you, O God, for the many places where COVID-19 is in decline. We are grateful for the vaccine distribution that is leading much of this decline. Assist us with this distribution and help us all to continue safe ways of living. Be with all those places where the virus is not in decline and be with all those who are, are or continue to be victims of this pandemic. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you.
let us pray, God of love. You call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us into service to a suffering world for the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Make us bold, O merciful Father, to address you as our Abba as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Once again, we're so glad that you could be with us in worship today. Worship throughout the summer months will continue to be at 9 a.m. in person here as well as online. Again, our Wednesday services have been discontinued until students return in late August, and we'll keep you informed about those things. Likewise, our forums on Sunday morning have been discontinued until the second Sunday in September when we will pick them up once more. In fact, if you have a forum that you would like to present, be in touch with us and we'll have a conversation about it and see what we can do. As always, we thank everyone who spends so much time putting these worship services together each and every week. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus. The God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. <laughs>